Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome. There you go. Can you hear me? No? Can you hear me now? A little up? Okay. For those beyond the, in the control room, a little higher, please. Welcome to the Whitliff Collections. My name is David Coleman. I'm director. That's louder. Thank you. <laughs> My name is David Coleman. I'm director here at the Whitliff, and I want to thank you so much for joining us in our celebration of The Devil's Backbone, uh, Bill Whitliff's first of a trilogy with the overarching title of The Papa Stories, published by our very good friends at the University of Texas Press. Um, as Jane Sumner, who will serve as our moderator uh, a little later on in the program, wrote in The Statesman, it's mythic, it's historic, it's folk wisdom and wit. Best of all, it's a master storyteller at the top of his game. And you really can't describe it any better than that. But also, of course, a vital part of the book are the illustrations, as you see on the cover here, by celebrated illustrator Jack Unruh. Jack. Now, why did Jack get an applause, but <laughs> Bill did not? Let's... I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Bill. Uh, anyway, and I hope, I hope you have seen more of the illustrations, uh, pen and ink drawings out in the exhibition cases at the front of the gallery. Uh, at the end of the program, if you haven't seen it, please uh, look at those. And there are some, also some pro preparatory sketches that Jack did, and he has very generously donated those to the Whitliff Collection. So thank you very much, Jack. Y'all are making it really easy. Thank you. So I'm going to go over the, the plan for to, today and introduce our cast. Uh, we're going to start off with a couple of readings uh, from Devil's Backbone, and we are delighted that the multi-Grammy Grammy award-winning singer, songwriter, producer, and Texas music icon Ray Benson is here with us to do our readings. And then we're going to invite Bill and Jack to discuss the book, guided along by our friend, who I've just already mentioned, Jane Sumner. And <laughs> if there's time, uh, of course, they'll take questions from the audience. Uh, after the program, we'll have a reception with food, more drink, uh, book sales over here, book signing over here. And we'll try to control the enthusiasm and traffic controlling. So bear with us all, please. But before we begin, I'd like to recognize uh, several of our special guests who are with us uh, today. Now, I've already introduced you, Bill, so you may not have to stand, but our founding donors, Bill and Sally Whitliff. Yes. So, <laughs> the Chancellor of the Texas State University System, Dr. Brian McCall. Rosanna Salazar, the Vice Chairman of the Board of Regents, Texas State University System. The President of Texas State University, Dr. Denise Trout. The library in which we are is a part of the Division of Information Technology, and we're delighted that we have our Vice President, Dr. Van Wyatt, here with us today. And we also have the Associate Vice President and University Librarian, and my boss, hint, hint, Joan Heath. Thank you. Well, again, thank you so much for coming. I hope you can all hear and see. Uh, I think this should be a lot of fun. Let's get started. As I said, this afternoon we'll have a couple of readings uh, show Jack's illustration for each of the scenes. Um, and I'll set up each scene before with a little background to tell you who some of the characters are. 
As a whole, the story follows Papa as he recounts his travels as a runaway boy searching for his missing mama, who has fled their home on her horse, Precious, to escape Papa's vicious daddy known as Old Carl. And maybe we should say every time Old Carl gets mentioned, we should <laughs> You're all a great crowd. <laughs> so keep it up. The path Papa pursues to find his mama thrusts him and his scrappy dog, Fritz, into adventures across the wild hard scrabble of the 1880s Texas Hill Country, down to Mexico and beyond, into the realm of the ghostly, shimmery people. Papa's twisting trail draws him ever nearer to a mysterious cave that haunts his dreams, an actual place where he eventually discovers in the canyons of the sneaking ridge of the Devil's Backbone. So, Ray, are you ready? Our first reading comes from the very beginning of the story. I'll get it ready for you. <laughs> you can stand, come on. There you go. It comes from the beginning of the story, as I said, right after we've just met Mama, whose name is Amanda, for the first time. We'll also hear from Herman, who's Papa's brother, and we'll hear what happens in this scene and what transpires here between Mama and old Carl <laughs> sets the whole novel in motion. Ray. I'm a little sensitive to those hisses, but uh, <laughs> I'm also very used to them. <laughs> and I can fight back. I have the microphone. <laughs> Now, old Carl's idea of a wife was somebody to cook, wash, and wait on him, Pop said. But Mama didn't fit no bill. She carried two pistols, smoked her a crooked pipe, and could shoot then skin a buck deer for it ever draw the last breath. But oh, she was tender when it came to horses. Catch one of us boys mistreating a horse, even old Molly, and she'd kick you halfway to Georgia and back. Now, old Carl, That'll suffice, this, <laughs> this could get bad, you know. Old Carl, on the other hand, wasn't tender about nothing on this earth. Not one thing, Papa said. For sure, not no horses. Amanda came down to the pens one morning when old Carl was trying to break a little bay mare with an ax handle and a rope. For her part, the little bay mare had tried to bite him, kick him, run him over, kill him, but old Carl was a veteran at such sass and gave her a good lick of the ax handle for each of her efforts. Papa and Herman got down to the pens just in time to see Amanda step through the rails and jerk the ax handle out of old Carl's hand. What the goddamn hell you think you're doing, she said. You're gonna kill her, you keep a hitting her like that. Yes, by God, I will kill her if she don't gentle, old Carl said, and raised up his hand for his ax handle. Mama whacked him across his fingers with it, Papa said. Oh, she was red hot mad, he said. They, they both was, but they was mad at each other all the time anyhow, so this wasn't nothing new. Give me that stick here, old Carl said. My mama wasn't about to. That ain't how you gentle a horse, and you damn well know it, she said. Be damn, I know it, old Carl said, and reached for the ax handle again. Mama stepped back. I can gentle this missy pretty as you please and don't need no damn stick to do it, she said. Old Carl's face went red as a beet. He was so mad, Papa said. The hell you say, old Carl said, and reached for the ax handle again. Yes, the goddamn hell I do say, Mama said. Papa said, then reared back with the ax handle to hit him again. If he went to grabbing for that old Carl. Oh, if he went to grab for it. Old Carl gave her the snake eyes, but he didn't want to get whacked with the ax handle again. Be damn you can gentle that horse, he said, then spit and walked off. Amanda waited until he was gone, then picked up the far end of the rope and ever so slowly, ever so carefully, led the little bay mare out of the pens and down to the creek. She was still panicky and shot at everything, Pop said, but Mama led her out in the creek about belly deep and started whispering to her. She told her she was sorry she'd been bad mistreated and told her that nobody would ever hit her like that again. No, not ever again, she said. Not ever again. Not ever, not ever, not never again. It was like some old chant, Papa said, like some old Indian chant. 
No, not ever, not ever, not ever again. No, not ever, not ever, not ever again. In a few minutes, the little bay mare put her head down and drank. Amanda petted her neck and cheek and then scratched her between the ears and splashed water up on her back and in her face. The little bay mare watched her but accepted it. No, not ever, not ever, not ever again, she crooned and then waved for the boys to come on in. Herman wanted no part of it, but Papa skinned his pants off and jumped in. Amanda patted the little bay mare's back and said, here, climb on. Before Papa could say no, Amanda grabbed him around his waist and hefted him up. Oh, the little bay mare exploded, Papa said. Bucked and pitched and just went to raising all kinds of hell and, and I went a flying off in the creek, but Mama waved me back on. Didn't hurt you none, didn't hurt you none either, Papa said. Well, she, she'll be too tired to buck here in a moment, won't she? Even, it won't even want no more and she won't be hurt no more one bit. Mama was right and it was fun too, Papa said. Amanda helped him back on. He was laughing now, then laughed some more when the little bay mare threw him off into the water again. Then Herman jumped in with his clothes on. In just a minute, he was taking turns getting bucked off in the water and just couldn't stop laughing. Even that little bay mare was having fun, Papa said. Every time she'd buck one of us off, why, why, she'd come back over and just stand there till Mama put the other one on. <laughs> After a while, she stopped her bucking altogether and we could ride her all over the place. It was the first time I ever seen Mama really laugh, Papa said. The last time, too. Well, old Carl was sitting out on the front porch smoking his pipe when they came back up to the pens from the creek with the boys riding double on the little bay mare. He didn't like seeing the four of them together like that. It made him think that they'd taken a side against him. Amanda had just drifted off to sleep that night when she heard the crack of a rifle shot come from down at the pens. She knew what it meant. I did too, Papa said. I run down there to the pens at the first light next morning, Papa said. The little bay mare was dead on the ground, just like I knowed she was gonna be. I couldn't help myself and just stood there and went to crying, he said. Well, what'd you reckon you was gonna find, Mama said from over yonder by the shed where she was saddling up, saddling up precious. No, I knowed what I was gonna find when I heard his big gun o off, Papa said. Yes, sir, Mama said. I know that little missy was dead when I seen she hadn't, she, when I seen she wasn't going to bend to him. Then she swung up in the saddle her daddy give her, but he just walked off with after the battle at the San Jacinto, the other one with the brass nails and shiny nickel conchos on it. Hand me up my sack there, she said. Papa picked up her cloth sack. It had her clothes in it. I knowed she was leaving, he said. He handed it up. She was looping the drawstrings over the horn when old Carl stepped through the fence rails, Herman trailing along behind and looking scared. Where do you think you were going off to this morning on that horse, he said. You the last man on this earth I'd tell that to, Amanda said. But I will tell you this, one thing I ain't never coming back. She gave him a long, cold look. You're a hard man, Carl, she said, and mean, and goddamn you to hell if you don't work at being both the same way another man might work at a job. Well, well, go on and on and go. If you don't want to be married to me, go no more, old, old Carl said. Hell, I, 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 don't, I won't miss you. Old Carl reached up and grabbed the bridle. But you can leave this horse right here where you found her, he said. By God, you ain't taking her. Mama put her hand on her, on one of her pistols and her face went cold as froze ice, Papa said. This is my horse and you'll take your hand off her, you son of a bitch, or I'll leave you dead on the ground same as you did the sweet baby yonder, Papa said, she said. Old Carl got him a better hold on the bridle and gave her his snake eyes. You better watch yourself out there, Miranda, he said. You don't never know what might come up. You don't never know what might come up at you in the middle of the night in this country around here. Mama cut her eyes at him for the warning. I reckon you'd be the one to know about that, she said. Then all of a sudden, Precious bared back her teeth and struck out to bite him like some old rattlesnake might do. And oh, it surprised old Carl so much he left out a holler and fell back on his bottom, Papa said it. And when he did, why, Mama touched her heels to Precious and galloped off, galloped on off, not even bothering to blow me or my brother Herman a kiss goodbye. And, and that just about broke my heart in two, he said. 
No sooner did Mama gone on down the road, Papa said, when old Carl told us boys to hitch up old Molly and drag that goddamn little mare's body off in the brush somewheres and set it to fire before it got to drawing flies and stinking. I cried all day, Papa said, and so did old Molly. But Herman just clomped his mouth shut and never let out a peep about it. That night, old Carl told us we was going to have to make our own suppers from now on out and, and our breakfast, too. That suited us just fine, he said. We didn't want to be around him no more than we had to. Next morning, old Carl was gone and not, worn, and not one word about it, Papa said. We gathered us up some, some chicken eggs and had us a breakfast, then went swimming in the creek. But they wasn't the same fun in it as it was the day before with Mama and the little bay mare. Herman said he didn't want to live here no more anyhow and was thinking he might just run off from the home and go live in a town somewhere and, and was Papa going to come along with him? Papa said, no, I want to be here when Mama comes back. You're just a stupid little boy, Herman said. Our Mama ain't never coming back. Papa started crying and said, yeah, yes, she is too. Maybe when you're an old man with a long gray beard, Herman said, maybe then. Papa put his face between his knees and started sobbing. Oh, hush, Herman said. That ain't, that ain't gonna bring her back. That night, Papa dreamed he saw his mother standing out there in front of the house. In his dream, Papa waved to her, but he said she'd just give a scared look back over her shoulder and to the woods like maybe there was something about to get her then and, and then run on down the road in the dark. Papa always believed he really did see his mama that night, that it wasn't a dream at all, that, that she'd come back to say she loved him and that she'd be back one day. But there was another part of time, he said, that, that thought, no, maybe mama'd come back to say goodbye forever. Thank you, Ray. I have to get up on my tiptoes here. Now, our second reading comes from about halfway into the novel. Papa has recently joined up with the friendly Callie Pearsall, a cowboy, who at this point, Papa doesn't really know if he can trust or not. The sheriff of Comal County has told Papa that he's after Callie and his partner, Jack Ivey III. But Callie confides to Papa that Jack is the actual murderer and that most the, the most Callie is guilty of is keeping bad company by riding with Jack. Callie also tells Papa that he's recently seen Mama's horse Precious, although no Mama. So Papa decides to stick with Callie until they find Precious, or better yet, Mama. Can I get an amen? <laughs> it's just... Always wanted to do that. <laughs> now me and Callie come a riding into Lockhart, Texas, Papa said, and the first thing Callie seen was old Jack Ivy and the thirds uh, uh, old Jack Ivy, the thirds horse, right there in the horse lot on the public square. Get that. Well, Bessa Makula. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I thought that was one of the characters. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me do that in the right accent. Well, Betha Makula, that old Jack's horse is standing right yonder, he said, and then I looked, Papa said, and why standing right there next to old Jack Ivy, the third's horse was my very own mama's horse, Precious. That's my mama's horse, I said, Papa said, and was about to give old Molly my heels to go over and give her a hug, but Callie signed me back to stay where I was and said, something's wrong here. It ain't like old Jack to raise up a flag. Uh, he's in town when he looked over across the street to Sidden's Longhorn Saloon and seen people going in and coming out and a man guarding at the door. That one's of the men was a riding with sheriff at Como County yesterday. Am I right or am I wrong, he said. I took me a look and sure enough it was it, sure enough, and it was, and, and I said, uh, yes, sir, you're right. I, I don't like it, Callie said. 
I bet they caught, I bet they caught poor old Jack and the sheriff of Como County got him chained up in there for cause. Uh, they're going to hang him too, I reckon he said. And, and, and not a goddamn thing to do about it but blow old Jack a kiss goodbye and then wave him adios amigo. I got to go over there and ask him how he happens to come by my mama's horse, Papa said. But maybe he knows where my mama is too. I, I, I'd go with you, Callie, but... But that old sheriff might try to drop me off a limb and a rope around my neck. I know it, Papa said, and I don't hold it against you that you're looking out for yourself then. I went to walking across the street with Fritz tagging him way long behind and, and went up to the man guarding the door. I'd like a visit with Jack Ivy the third, please, sir, I said, Papa said. The man gave me a little smile and said, oh, you would, huh? Yes, sir, I would, I said, and he said, well, Jack Ivy the third's in there with the sheriff, but they had him a long day and they both pretty much all talked out, I reckon. Well, I still need to talk to him, I said. I, I think he might know where my mama is. Oh, now I remember you, the man said. You, that little boy, was on the road yesterday looking for his mama. Yes, sir, Papa said. That's me, and I still am. Well, there ain't nobody in there can tell you where your mama is, so you and your little pooch there might just as well get and run along now. Well, maybe if I talk to Sheriff of Como County, he'll let me talk to uh, Mr. Ivy the third a minute or two, Papa said. No, I don't believe he would, the man said. Now run along for I lock you up in a jail for being a public nuisance. That's when I remembered. I had the five dollars Callie gave me in my pocket. So I pulled it out and said, well, tell the Sheriff of Como County I give him this five dollars here if he'll take me to talk to Mr. Ivy the third and the man sucked that five dollars right out of my hand and said, "Well, I don't guess it'd hurt to ask him would it, uh, uh, ask him uh, uh, would it anyway." And, and he went in to ask the sheriff, "Could I talk to Jack Ivy the Third about my mama or not?" Then, uh, then here, then maybe he'd come right back out again. And said the sheriff said he was going to allow it and and, and thank you for the five dollars. And, and and then the man stepped back and pointed out across the room to the doorway in the back where people all lined up to go in. Go on, the man said. The sheriff of Como County and old Jack Ivy the third is both in there visiting with everybody. So, Papa said, I picked Fritz up, I picked Fritz up to me and got in line with them other people. Then I accidentally turned and got me a look back out the front door. And boy, howdy, there went old Callie Pearsall, just a galloping off down the street on Firefoot. And oh, he had my mama's horse precious tied on a long rope behind him, and she was a running off down the street too. Well, I didn't know what to do, Papa said. Of course, I didn't have no choice, neither. I couldn't have made old Molly run fast enough to catch him, even if I'd put a firecracker, firecracker up under her tail and lit it afire. Then he said, the man come up behind me and said, it's your turn now, but just remember to talk loud, because they've both gone a little hard of hearing here lately. So I stepped in, Papa said, and oh, wasn't nobody in there but four feet sticking up from under the, some bloody old bed sheets. Which one do you want to talk to first, the man said, then pulled the coverings back to show me the dead and naked bodies of the sheriff of Como County and Jack Ivy the Third, with bullet holes all in them both and liquids just a oozing out of every one of them holes to the floor so you had to watch where you stepped. It was so slick. Ask him anything you like, the man said. Just remember, talk loud. <laughs> now, how'd they come to this bad end, Papa said? Oh, 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 wasn't nothing to it, the man said. The sheriff come over here to get him a refreshment, and there was old Jack standing there at the bar getting him one, too. And the sheriff said, Jack, you're going to have to come with me for criminal acts. And Jack said, no, I don't do it. And the sheriff said, I ain't asking you, Jack. I'm telling you. And Jack said, you must have a wasp nest in your goddamn ear, you son of a bitch. You don't hear me saying no. And the sheriff said, I got three armed men standing across the street yonder. And I can call them all over here if I have to. And Jack said, if you don't put up no more value on their life than, the, what, than that, why, why then go on and call them over. But, but I'm thinking I may be better go on and, and shoot you right now anyway before the odds get to stacking up against me with them other three coming over here. Let's us just talk about this a minute, the man said, the sheriff said. But 
Old Jack said, no, let's just go to shooting. I'm tired of them fooling around with you, you sorry son of a bitch, and everybody else in this world like you. And, and so they just went to shooting back and forth at each other, and then and they went to running and hiding over behind the chairs and tables and doors and people just to fleeing in every direction, and then bullets are hitting so close all around them. Old Jack fell down dead, dead over there by the footrail to the bar, and then the sheriff himself, just a bleeding, stepped over to him, and well, Jack, I reckon you learned your lesson now, huh? But if not, I still got me a bullet or two in my pistol for you. And, and then he gave him a little kick just to be mean about it, and, and when he did, old Jack raised up in a big surprise and let pop with his last bullet and went in there under the sheriff's chin and come up there at the top of his head in a big mess of blood and goo. Anyhow, he said, that's, that's what the bartender seen it all said. And then one more thing the man said, if it don't matter to you, I'm going to give over your five dollars to the sheriff's handsome widder as a gift when I go pay respect for uh, but before I could answer, Papa said, he said, I I'll ask you to pull them sheets back up over the dead faces when you're done your look. And then, the, the, then he gave me a smile and a knock on my head and, and, went, and went out the door and, and I did what he asked me to do. And then me and Fritz went on out too. And, and that was the last time I ever did see old Jack Ivy the third, the man who might could have told me where my mama was, but he was dead now and I was sick about it. Of course, it was a mystery to me, too, Papa said, where old Callie Pearsall had got off to with my mama's horse precious, but they just wasn't no way to know, so I give my heels to the old sway back, and me and Fritz went a-riding on on out to Lockhart, Texas, feeling bad about just, just about everything there was in the world to feel bad about. <laughs> now, what do you all want to do? You want to come up and I can introduce you after you come up, or you want me to introduce you there? Come on up. Why don't you come on up? Okay. Now, before you all get started, I need to do a little formal introduction. Bill's not big on formality, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I'm just going to introduce each of you in turn. Distinguished screenwriter and producer Bill Whitliffe. His credits include Lonesome Dove, The Perfect Storm, Black Stallion, Legends of the Fall, among many others. With his wife, Sally, he founded the highly regarded Encino Press in Austin and the Whitliffe Collections here at Texas State University. And speaking of Texas State, this past spring, this fine university honored Bill and Sally with much deserved honorary doctorates. So remember, when you address them, Dr. Whitliffe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn then to Jack Unruh, a celebrated and award-winning illustrator whose art has appeared in numerous publications, including Entertainment Weekly, Rolling Stone, Atlantic Monthly, Time, Sports Illustrated, Reader's Digest, New York Magazine, National Geographic, Sports and Field, Field and Stream, and GQ. <laughs> Save the best for last there. Now, he, here in Texas, you, you probably know him best for his silly series of illustrations for The Texanist in Texas Monthly Magazine. And his work has appeared in Communication Arts Illustrated Annual since its inception. And he's been in numerous shows of American Illustration, Graphis, AIGA, and Print. Our moderator, Jane Sumner. A critic and film columnist for the Dallas Morning News for some 20 years, Jane now does stories and book reviews for The Statesman and The Dallas Morning News. 
and I would say her keen intelligence and good taste might best be demonstrated by the fact that she was the first in the country, at least I believe the first in the country, to review The Devil's Backbone. <laughs> As you've already heard, she gave it a glowing review. <laughs> what a great fanfare. <laughs> For you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so please welcome Bill, Jack, and Jane. Welcome to the Bill and Jack Show. <laughs> it's not every Sunday afternoon that, as the New York Times called them, two paragons of Texas culture and two great storytellers, Bill with his words and Jack with his pen and ink drawings, come together on the same dais. When you look at the 25 full-page illustrations in The Devil's Backbone, which incidentally is a 51 mile loop in the Texas Hill Country, Bill and Jack seem like star-crossed collaborators, so it's hard to believe that they first met in person November 6th at the Book People gig in Austin. <laughs> uh, they were both born in small towns, Bill in Edna, Texas, Jack in Pretty Prairie, Kansas. Uh, a town of 400, south of Hutchison and west of Wichita. Both have done it this way. Bill made his bones as a screenwriter, director, and producer far from Hollywood in Austin, and Jack as an esteemed illustrator far from New York and LA in Dallas. Both work in century-old historic houses Bill believes we walk through life in a continuous miracle. Jack's friend, C.F. Payne, says he can't think of one instance when Jack looked at a glass as half empty. He says, Jack comes from the school of why not? <laughs> and both are Hall of Famers. Bill is in the Texas Film and the Texas Literary Halls of Fame, and Jack in the Illustrators Hall of Fame. So Bill, most novels these days do not have illustrations. These days when as a friend of mine says we all work for Amazon. <laughs> and if they do have art, it's not of the caliber of uh, the devil's backbone. So when and why did you decide you needed illustrations in your first novel and what led you, who are an artist yourself, to Jack Unra? I wanted to see what my stories look like. And um, <laughs> Dave Hamrick, who's the director of uh, the University of Texas Press, and I early on decided it would be a really neat thing to have this book illustrated, like the books of the last century, you know, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s were illustrated. and. Um, so once we decided that, I, I called my friend DJ Stout and said, who do you recommend? And, um, and he said, Jack Unruh. And I said, surely not. And uh, he said, <laughs> 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 and he said, uh, Jack's the guy. And I knew Jack's stuff a little bit, then I really looked at it. And I asked uh, DJ to uh, give him a ring and see if he would be interested in thinking about considering it and reading the manuscript. And Jack did, and, uh, and very quickly we got to be telephone friends. And, uh, and it became a, this kind of wonderful telephone collaboration, I guess I'd say. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, the first illustration Jack did that I saw was of Old Carl, which is out in one of the cases. And, and that was, in fact, the first time I had a visual image of a character that had actually dropped out of my pencil. So it was, uh, it, it was a wonderful thing to, to be working with somebody like that who was uh, as sensitive, I think, to my stories as I hoped an illustrator could be. So. And Jack, not since the days of the great illustrators like 
in CYF have we seen work like this? You're an ace draftsman, an excellent caricaturist, and you're a busy artist with a withering schedule of uh, clients. You've illustrated annual reports, ad campaigns, you've been in magazines from Rolling Stone uh, to uh, National Geographic to Texas Monthly's uh, advice column. Whatever possessed you at this point to agree to illustrate your first novel? Every now and then you really screw up. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, nobody had ever asked me to, you know, I've, I've done book covers for different things, but nobody had ever asked me to illustrate, you know, a whole bunch of pictures. I mean, 25 in a year is a whole goddamn mess of pictures. And uh, other stuff to take care of along the way. So uh, that intrigued me, you know, because I thought, you know, here you can develop a storyline and people and, you know, have, have time to really amass you know, some kind of visual image over a period of time, which takes you through the book. Plus the fact, I really love the story, you know. I don't know if, you, what a tremendous job he did of reading that today. And, you know, he really put life to it. Uh, I wish I'd had him read it to me when I started this thing. <laughs> In fact, if you do a, a, a book, talking book thing, there's your man. But, um, you know, it, it was just really had so much visual depth to, you know, I really didn't have to work hard. The only thing we had to work hard was on how to pare it down to 25 because as I read through it, you know, I made little notes about things that I, I wanted to do or images that I thought would be interesting that I said, you know, I can see that. That would be a fun thing to do. And uh, anyway, I may be getting ahead of some things that Jane has to ask, but that, you know, it was an exciting project. Um, you know, and, uh, and I'm really, really glad I did it. Uh, first of all, I got to come down here and see this amazing collection today of many different things. And uh, you know, it, it's an exciting place to be, and I thank you. <laughs> uh, Bill, before we get into who or what triggered uh, your picaresque novel, let's go back to a kind of awakening you had as a kid, reading a book your aunt, who worked at Foley's in Houston, sent you. Can you tell us about that and uh, how it figured in your writing? Uh, well, the book you're talking about is, is from J. Frank Doby, Old Time Tales of Texas. Um, let me see how to tell this. Um, my father was a terrible drunk. My mother said he simply could not walk past a bottle of beer, and that was true. My mother left him because she was afraid that he was going to drag us down. And she took a job with a telephone company in Gregory. We lived there. Um, at that time and in those places, women who were divorced uh, were kind of considered off to the side. There was a little bit of stigma. And if you were a boy in those places without a father, and your father wasn't in the Army in the 40s, then you were a little bit to the side too. We moved from there to Edna. In Edna, there was a man who lived down the street who was a great storyteller. And every evening after supper and when the fireflies started twinkling, he would sit on his porch and tell stories. If you went the other way, there was a lumber company and a wonderful man named Gus Westoff uh, would give you a board and some nails and tell you to go build something, but he'd tell you a story. And he told me the story about the wild woman of the Navidad, which was an, about an escaped slave who the ranchers and farmers tried to catch for years and she ran loose in the Navidad bottoms and for a while they saw the tracks of a young child along with hers and then after a while the tracks disappeared and, you, and they only saw hers and they never did catch her but when, I, when he told me that story uh, I, I was just uh, I got so focused on that child and on that mother uh, about the loss that it just kind of permeated me. And I never forgot it. And I felt sorry for the child and I felt sorry for the mother. And then when I was, I think, uh, 12 or 13, my aunt sent me a copy of Dobie's book. And the third or fourth story in there was The Wild Woman of the Navidad. And there was that story I had first heard as an oral tradition in a book, in type. 
and, and for the first time uh, it came to me that um, books and writing could come right, right out of your own piece of ground. And it absolutely set me afire. And um, this place is, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I mean, is a result of that connection. So, and in the next volume of the Papa Stories, I mean, it's, it has a lot of the Wild Woman of the Davidad in it as I've reinvented it for my own purposes. But that's where it comes from. Well, for the Statesman story, I went to Bill's office in the old Marley house uh, where uh, the short story writer uh, O. Henry once hung out. Uh, Chica, Bill's poodle, slept through the whole interview, but there were some choice moments. So one was when uh, Bill let me hold my hero John Graves belt buckle uh, in the shape uh, of the infinity sign, and another when he told me about the rather startling deal he made with himself before beginning to write The Devil's Backbone. Would you talk about free writing, Bill? Uh, well, the deal I made with myself was that, that um, I would just trust what came out of the pencil. I wouldn't try to, to figure it out or plot it or anything like that. And um, from time to time, once you start that way, you just kind of open it and, and go. And from time to time, a character would knock on the door and want to come in the story. And, uh, and I would make the same deal with all of them, which was you can, you can come in, you can be a part of this story, uh, unless you get boring. <laughs> and, and if you get boring, then the next guy through the door is either going to shoot you, hang you, or run you out of town. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that, for me anyway, that, that pretty much worked. You know, but, uh, but I tried, and it wasn't hard for me to, but I, I, I didn't want to think it. I wanted to just, you know, connect with whatever part of me had the itch and scratch it. And um, by writing the book, and, and that's what it is. Now, that's not to speak to the quality of it. That's to speak to the process. <laughs> okay. uh, Jack, you've drawn real people from J.R. Tolkien to Harry S. Truman and a lot of presidents. Uh, my favorite in the book is the uh, drawing of Papa waiting on the porch for his mama to come riding up on Precious through the crystal road that he has assembled of uh, icy leaves. And I wondered, uh, how did you view Papa, and who was your model? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was an easy one. Um, actually, I'm going to go back just a little bit as to how I got to that image, because Bill, when you get a chance to read this thing, has all these, it's had been kind of a fine mist develop over the trees, and so these leaves and then it freezes, and these leaves fall into like little crystals, and Papa lays them out waiting for his mama to come back, who's supposed to come back at Christmas time. And I kept trying to figure out, how in the hell am I going to show all these leaves? I'll die, you know, before I get to number 3,405. <laughs> and I said, there's got to be another way around this thing. So uh, I said, okay, we're going to draw Papa waiting on the porch. And uh, I've got four grandsons. One of them is going to school here. He's 6'5". He wouldn't work. But my, my nine-year-old was pretty close to around the right age, and uh, so I, uh, I hired him for, you know, six snicker bars and a lollipop <laughs> to, to pose. And, uh, you know, we went ahead and did the drawing of him sitting on the porch just kind of waiting in a cold thing. And if you wonder why he doesn't have shoes on in the cold weather, that's because his old man Carl wouldn't buy him shoes. And so I remember when I got ready to draw that, and I, I called Bill and I said, do you think by now Papa's got shoes? And he said, no, he doesn't. <laughs> so who is Papa? And how is he getting this book, Bill? Uh, I suspect he's a combination of, you know, stories my grandfather told, my mother told, my relatives told. Um, and he's just kind of a a combination of all those people and the imagination. Um, this book is inspired by stories my people told me. 
but it's not it's not these stories. So, but the other way to answer is I have no idea on her. <laughs> you did have some printed material though from your your grandfather that you were. Uh, oh, what? Years ago, um, when Sally and I first got out of college, I uh, went to visit my grandfather and I asked him to write his memoirs. And he didn't have even a second grade education, but he went down to the junk store and he bought an old typewriter. And with one finger of one hand, he started typing his memoirs. Now, he didn't know how a typewriter worked, so he started way over here before the type was actually hitting the paper. And he kept typing long after it was off the paper. <laughs> and he did 40 some odd pages. And then Sally and I went back down there. And, and of course I had the middle of what he had to say. <laughs> but not the beginning and not, not the end. Um, but it turned out to be a wonderful blessing um, because then I, I essentially got to say, pop up, you know, what was this, what was this, who was this, and so on. And he would tell me things that he never would have put on paper because he was always afraid. He'd say, well, there are people might come back on me, you know. And um, so. And how about your amazing mother? What role does she play? In well, this mother, also, mother also, you know, after my grandfather did his, then I asked my mother to do hers. And for two years, my mother got some big chief tablets, and, uh, and, and she wrote her memoirs. And after she finished them, then Connie, where are you, Connie? Connie, my dear Connie Todd, uh, set them in type, and we made a book for my mother, which she could then give to you know, her sisters and brothers and friends and all that stuff. But um, most of mother's stuff if if the thing goes that long, will will you know come into play in other vo later volumes. And Jack, from the time you were a youngster and you wanted to be a game warden, <laughs> and your dad, who was in the Air Force, thought maybe you could make a living drawing pictures. And uh, you've been an outdoor guy. You love the wilderness. You love uh, flora and fauna. Uh, you painted caribou for Field and Stream. You did the uh, male uh, silverback for the Bronx Zoo. And there are a lot of fish on your entertaining uh, website, jackundra.com. Uh, where did uh, Mr. Pegleg, the uh, three-legged coyote who licks Papa's face, where did he come from to get on the page? Well, I knew we had to do it uh, because he's an important character, and I hadn't drawn a lot of coyotes. Hang on to this if you would like. There's Mr. Pegley right Oh, there. okay. Uh, also in the um, <coughs> so, um, so in, in, anyway, you know, uh, I found just a variety of photographs on coyotes, and uh, you know, I just tried to piece things together and then imagine a little bit of what he might be like. <laughs> and uh, construct him so that, uh, you know, then I ended up with him and I really liked him, you know. So he got to be the full page and I said, what the hell are we going to put Papa? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we just stuck his toes in there at the bottom and, and, and uh, which is the way a lot of things go, you know, you don't plan everything. The illustration is a little bit like Bill's stories. You know, you kind of start out with uh, something you're going to do and, and then things develop and come along that either really mess things up or, you know, put a little bit of a spark and shine to it. So, uh, you know, he, he's just kind of a construct of a variety of coyotes. And Bill, some of the characters uh, come out of family ex experiences and your own personal history. Uh, where did Mr. Pegleg come from? As a matter of fact, Mr. Pegleg was one of my grandfather's stories, which he type deal, it was only about a couple of sentences, but in the spring, uh, when it started getting warm, he would sleep out on the front porch and, uh, of a farmhouse. And one night he woke up and there was a coyote uh, kissing his face. <laughs> and uh, and he, it was such a thing to him that when he wrote his memoirs, I mean, that was a thing he said in a couple of sentences. And then I took that and just 
And once, once Mr. Pegleg got on paper, then he wanted to do things. He was like the other characters that were coming through the door. And uh, I mean, I was about to put him back in the brush and you know, send him back to the country. And uh, no, he wanted to come back and stay. So, and that was my deal with all of them. I think. And uh, where does uh, Papa's uh, oracular uh, half brother, who was uh, born in a wheelbarrow with a uh, birthmark of a bird on his chest, where, where is he? The blue baby. <laughs> yeah, the blue baby. Yeah. Where does he come from? Um, there was a girl in my kindergarten class in first grade, and. Her mother, when we got to the second grade, kept her from coming to school. And so I asked my mother, what's, you know, what's happened to Janice? And mother said, well, she, her mother is keeping her home because she's a blue baby. And I didn't, I had no idea what that meant. I said, well, a blue baby that, you know, so she looks funny. And uh, I didn't know it was that, you know, she had been born so premature that her organs didn't develop and she was not expected to live beyond what was then second third grade i guess and in fact she did die but but i never knew i didn't know that a blue baby was a preemie until much later and then i thought whoa and then again when this little baby is born you know right at fisher hall while people are dancing inside you know when the lady <laughs> came out with her, she was a blue baby. So she just, I mean, again, it's that business of uh, some part of me itched and that's how I scratched. And how about the torrential thunderstorm that tears all the leaves off the trees? The hailstorm. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother and I actually went through a hailstorm like that at the ranch in Blanco when I was in high school. And I mean, Mm -hmm. You know, they had told us that in uh, high school, because this was right after the great, I guess it was a Waco tornado, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It tore up mm -hmm. Waco. And at school, they said, you know, this is the time of year you're going to get some bad weather and so on. And if you're out somewhere and the wind's blowing, but all of a sudden it stops and then changes direction so I can look out because that's a storm coming. And Mother and I were actually out in the yard watching the weather which all country people did. And uh, the wind was just blowing like crazy. And then uh, all of a sudden the wind stopped. And, um, and when the wind stopped, uh, I looked over at Mother and I said, we better look out. And then here it came from the other direction. And with it, this massive hailstorm uh, that stripped every leaf off of every tree, every blade of grass for as far as you could see. And then after that, um, the sun came out, and then this fog started lifting off the ground, and uh, and it was so eerie. But you never, you know, you never forget something like that. And then if you turn your hand to writing or art or whatever, then all these things that made a made an impression on you at, at some point in your life, then you try to use them in in what you do. And I did. That's where that came. And Jack, there's some bad hombres in this uh, book. I wonder who your model was for uh, old Carl, the uh, vicious uh, father. Well, a, a lot of those different people, you know, I, I kind of conglomerated from old photographs and stuff, but Carl actually just drew from Bill's description. He, he was pretty much, the head of Carl is pretty much just an imaginary thing. And, uh, you know, just from the description of him and, and then, uh, Judy and our son, uh, Chris, became the model for the for the body, which you know I, I took photographs of, and you don't use them exactly the way they come out in the photographs, but you kind of piece them together. But uh, Carl was pretty much just direct inspiration from Bill. Many of the others, uh, if you ever look at the wanted posters and, you know, there's about five people in every newspaper in the morning, you know, they say, you know, wanted for aggregated robbery and whatever. Well, a lot of those people came from those kind of things, which I figure they can't come back and sue me for those images. <laughs> They've got other problems and they're busy. Um, 
<laughs> but, but there are one or two here. If Michael O'Brien, who happens to be here today, ever looks at it really closely, he, he might see some form of inspiration that developed in some of his images. <laughs> Just inspiration, Michael. And uh, my last question uh, is for Bill. Uh, one of the most endearing aspects to me of the book is your sense of the supernatural, of the mystery of life and death. And Papa visits a seer, friendly with haunts, who won't tell him his future. Um, he dreams of his mother, who may or may not be alive. And he meets the spectral, shimmery people, the uh, mystical people over there on the other side of the creek. Um, would you tell us how you regard the shimmery people and uh, why they're in the book and what they mean to you? Well, um, I believe we all have invisible helpers. I've always believed that. I know I have. I know there is a movie god, or there would be no Lonesome Dove. <laughs> um, and I just view this, as, I mean, that we're all walking across a landscape that has two sides of the curtain, you know? And, and uh, so this... I mean, this does not seem goofy to me. It may, it may to you, and it may be. But also, and let me tell you one more thing, and it's a, a good way to quit. Uh, my people are all country people. Uh, they planted by the moon, you know. Uh, folk wisdom was their wisdom. Folk healing was their healing. Um, um, my, <laughs> my mother could levitate tables. Um, she and her sisters would get above a table like this, and the table would come up on one end, and they would ask it, how old is Billy? And it would knock out six. And then, and, but, th but this, was, this was not goofy stuff. You know, Jim, my brother and I thought, this is kind of goofy, and they must be doing it with their knees, and we would crawl under the table, um, but they weren't. So, so this all, none of this seems strange to me or not a part of, of the world we all live in, you know. And again, you can't, you simply, Ray would probably back me on this, you simply can't lead a creative life uh, without having a sense of other forces uh, at work on you and at work on your work, you know, that um, I'm going to go one step further with this. Um, I don't believe, and I've said this before, but I don't believe great art, great poetry, great music, great movies ever tell you anything. What they do is they remind you of things that you already know but didn't remember you know. And that's why when we see a great piece of art or hear a great piece of music raised and so on, uh, that our response to it, if it's great, is an instant yes. We say yes. We don't say, why is that? We just say yes. And I think it's because it's already in us. And what our artists do, what our great writers do, our great poets do, and so on, is, is they help bring it out and manifest it so that we can see it, feel it, live with it, live from it. Uh, and, that's the, and that's the great gift of creative lives, in, in, in my view. And whether that's true or not, I really like to believe it. <laughs> and before I... <laughs> and before asking for your questions, uh, I would like to pay tribute to Bill's uh, beloved co-author, uh, his pal and his writing companion. Uh, to whom, along with his grandkids, uh, he dedicates the book, The Late Great Poodle Ocho. Uh. <laughs> Are there questions? So how come we haven't seen a book until now? 
I'm how, sorry. How come we haven't seen a book until now, Mr. Whitlip? You've been busy doing other stuff? Yeah, I've been doing, <laughs> you know, other stuff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, 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 you know, this is a time when, uh, I mean, I hope it's good. I hope people like it and, and all of that. But I'm, but I'm not psychologically dependent on it, which is, which, you know, which is a deal with being this old. Um, so it was just, and it was just, it was just a time for me, you know. And I suspect the style of this comes out of, you know, having done screenplays. Yeah, the narrative. Yeah, so. It's been called Faulknerian, but I think it's Widlifian. Um, <laughs> anybody? Yes. Again, um, for the next two books, or not with be Jack. There'll be two other illustrators for for those books. Okay. We could just... we could we can only go so far with Jack. And when when can we <laughs> <laughs> when can we expect he, he, he those? learned his lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when can we expect those? Uh, I would guess the second one is uh, a year away, maybe maybe a little longer than that. Arlen, the uh, kid with the devil's hand on him, I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more of Arlen in the, uh, in the next book. And uh, anyone else in the audience with a question? Yes. Oh, I'm a teacher. I don't need this. I can project. Um, Papa is your character, and I heard you refer to your grandfather as Papa. Is that where you got the name? That is where I got the name, yeah. So you say that you have made notes. This is this is for Jack Henry. Um, you said you'd made notes on pictures and then had to limit it to 25. How many pictures did you think you would have come up with if you hadn't been limited? Boy, I um, I think we were up to 38 or so, uh, or maybe more. Uh, I, They've got all the stuff here now, and you can go through. But I just kept drawing little boxes and writing on them, and you know, and and then we tried to figure out a way. Bill says, "Well, we can't." I think we had like three coyote paintings or drawings I was going to do. Well, we figured, you know, we can't give old Peg Leg that much press, so uh, we had to skinny that down and, and get rid of one of those. <laughs> and uh, then we figured maybe. 10 to 12 to 15 pages apart. So then we went through there and tried to say, okay, well then we can kind of spread them out. And there are a few gaps that didn't work out quite that way, but uh, it was just, you know, there's a tremendous amount of material in there that's very visually exciting and, and you know, you get to draw people with guns and, and toes getting cut off and blood spurting. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's good stuff, you know. That, I don't get to do that for gardening gun. I mean, you know, that <laughs> Those ducks that die can't have blood on them. <laughs> so, Bill, if, uh, if, if you, um, what's, what would be the soundtrack to this book? <laughs> well, it would be, it would, I would guess it would be you, Ryan. <laughs> and, uh, I want to plant that seed. You know. <laughs> One more question. Was your experience in writing the book, Bill, as rewarding as writing The Lonesome Dove? You know, it's a, it's a wholly different experience. Uh, you know, Lonesome Dove, I, I adapted from McMurtry's great book. And that's, that's very different. I was trying to be loyal uh, to Larry's vision. You know, uh, in my book, I was trying to be loyal um, to my vision as I understood it consciously. Um, so it's it's very different. I mean, it was a it was a great joy and and so on to do Lonesome Dove. I mean, I just loved it, and that was a year. I mean, from the time I started writing the screenplay for that until I finished it, it was it was one year, and it was a great year, uh, great fun, and it was great. And it was then another year to make it. And that was also great fun. And it's still fun because 
uh, people, I mean, we get people from all over the world who want to go in that little room across the hall and see Gus's body and, you know, it's, it's just been an astonishing thing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Bill Whitliffe, Jack Onion, and Jane Sumner.